Brent, I'm going to toss to you once again, my friend, yeah. and uh, let's listen in. Okay, appreciate that. Sorry for the technical issues, everybody. Appreciate the patience. Uh, like that was quite an intro, Jeff. Uh, I think today I'd also like to introduce Steve Jackson. He's a senior tech fellow on my team. And in combination with myself and Steve, we're going to hopefully enlighten the minds and take you guys on an innovation journey where we're going to hopefully um, set the stage for the rest of the presentations over the next two days where we'll tell you what's front and center from a modernization and tech perspective, but also what's kind of coming down the road so that you guys can adequately prepare your strategic sessions, the way you think about it, your digital transformation journeys, and just some of the top trends that are being adopted across um, various enterprises. And so again, we'll, we'll go through those top trends. We'll take a little bit of a deep dive into two of them that seem to be front and center that dominate the news, AI, and everything that is AI and all the innovation around that space, and then platform modernization. And so platform modernization means everything you could think of around the world of apps, data, and, and automized, automization. Uh, and then we'll kind of just deep dive at the end and some Q&A. Um, this is an interactive session, so we're going to have a number of different polls to kind of take the pulse of what everybody's thinking about the topics we're discussing. And then um, instead of so just kind of pushing out content, we're going to try to do a little bit of live demos, time permitting, uh, to actually show you in practice just how easy AI has become. So I'll let Steve kind of introduce himself as well, because I think, Jeff, we missed him at the top. Oh, hey, Al. Yeah, I work uh, uh, on uh, modern apps, on modern architecture. So we have... Um, um, teams working on, you know, we're basically a design driven organization. We have teams working on front end apps like react, react native for mobile. And those kind of business decisions and user experiences and customer experiences, at least to us, uh, drive what cloud infrastructure and data looks like in the back end. And from there, we have folks working on, uh, cloud infrastructure. Uh, we work, uh, cross cloud providers. So we'll have uh, teams on GCP or AWS or Azure. Uh, and then moving into data, we have uh, data expertise and, um, and then AI uh, ML behind that. Um, you know, we, we span uh, the entire stack um, when we engage, uh, when my teams engage, we basically understand the business, uh, form a plan and execute, and then, you know, measure and support from there on. So that's kind of my role here at InterVision. Thanks, Steve. And so what you're looking at here are the top 2023 innovation and modernization trends. And what InterVision has access to is about six different think tanks, all the way from Gartner to Forrester to MIT. And we get all these fancy reports and they give us fancy presentations. But what we've done for today is distilled this down into eight concepts for innovation and modernization, which are front and center now. I think that these are cross industry. There are definitely different innovation and modernization trends that get industry specific, but these are eight concepts that people can wrap their heads around that span all industries, all companies of all size and are really applicable now. Now, with that said, I would say personally, some of these are far out there and non attainable. Um, some of them are very real. And so you'll see that reflected in the orange. We're going to take deep dives into those ones next. But what my, I'd like to do is kind of explain a little bit what each of these eight are. Um, and then again, we'll get into a little bit more of how these are applicable and the business outcomes that are related to some of these. Uh, and so let's go through platform modernization. This is near and dear to our hearts here at InterVision. Um, again, I lead that platform modernization team in combination with Steve. And this is basically where People in the industry are modernizing their apps. They're bringing their applications to cloud native solutions. And what does that mean? That basically means they're bringing them to the hyperscalers, the AWSs, the Azures, the GCPs, and they're taking advantage of the compute and storage capabilities to make their applications smarter, to take them to lower cost operating models, to take them to more scalable and more interactive type of UI and UX experiences, not for just internal consumption, but external consumption. 
And so how they do that on the back end is through modern microservice architectures and event-driven architectures. And so what event-driven apps means is basically there's a lot of human intervention in apps these days. A lot of the taken in, in, in the modern architectures, we take some of those human interactions out and we layer in AI into your applications. And that pushes out events to get then get triaged. And so we're moving from a really reactive to a very proactive modern type architectures with applications. Another big platform modernization is low code, no code. And so people, especially in the small, mid sized business market, are trying to enable a lot of the low code, no code. So this is where we're moving to SaaS platforms uh, and we're essentially enabling drag and drop for people across your enterprises. So people who used to have to go into interfaces which were complicated for coding, they can now go into natural language interfaces and say, make me a script in SQL Server that spits this output. And so really what it's doing is it's bringing hard technical problems to the broader surface area and making it easier for um, all people and all clients and all enterprises to basically take advantage of code behind the scenes and natural language interfaces. I think another one that's happening in this space that was near and dear is data. And so what's happening is the hyperscalers, the Azure's, the AWS's, the Snowflakes, all of these partners and products are making it simpler and easier to bring your data and start data programs. So it used to be in, in, in the old times, I'm talking old times as in five to 10 years ago, you know, the whole concept of starting a data strategy was, was expensive. It was hard. It had took multi years. You had to have different tools, different processes and different skill sets to do everything from data acquisition to data storage to data visualization. In today's world, these tools and services are easy, meaning in one stop shop in a matter of days, you can hook up your data sources to a lot of this and get visualizations and the benefits of a modern data platform pretty quickly. Uh, and so that technology stack has come down to the masses and made it more consumable. So these are some of the big trends within modernization that we're seeing. We'll get a little bit deeper into that um, in the subsequent slides. And the next one, everything AI. You know, you can't, you can't walk out your door, you can't turn on your TV, you can't look at your devices, um, you know, everything from 60 minutes to TikTok to commercials to 50 emails a day. I'm sure everybody's getting things about everything about AI and what the AI space looks like. Um, we're going to go deep into this, but the trends are three things that you should think about when you think of AI. Adaptive, generative, and trusted. And so adaptive AI was the world that's past us now. This is where we used machine learning to say, hey, I would like an outcome of these two data sets and we would tell it the outcome and we would say, hey, here's a picture of Brent and here's a picture of Steve. Tell me who's who. So that's the world of adaptive AI that is well matured and is now moved beyond us. Adaptive AI made um, moves to generative AI. Everybody knows generative AI is chat GPT, um, Bard, um, Badu. There's a whole series of tools coming out that does generative AI. And the easiest way to think about generative AI is it's learning and it's learning on its models. And so a real world example of this, somebody asked me to give an example of chat GPT. I use the example of Google. Google goes off if he asks for a query of give me the best restaurants in Bellevue, Washington. It'll go off and it'll search and it'll give you a list. Chat GPT, if you go ask it in the same context, It'll go off, it'll do the same search, it'll use the same web crawlers, but it'll also go into those websites and it will read all the chat data. It'll look at all the stars of all the reviews. It'll go off into all the social media, Twitters and things of that nature. And it'll pull off all of the quotes and everything else that's being done, the amount of searches that are being done on that. And it'll come together and put those together in an algorithm saying, hey, based upon all that data, we think that this is generally the best 10 restaurants in Bellevue, Washington. And so it goes a little bit deeper in its search capabilities, but it also then takes those parameters and creates its own search on a learning model. As you kind of move up the AI stack, you're moving to trusted AI. 
And this is where you're taking the learnings from generative AI and you're enabling AI to do remediation or proactive uh, results in your enterprise. So you're saying, hey, the best example of this would be, I use the, uh, I use the example of if you get an intrusion detection on some of your uh, network, AI will help you identify that. It will identify that this is something that it can triage, and then you'll trust it to go off and close that port. And so it's moving from the detection to the learning understanding of what's happening to the proactive trusted AI of, of um, response. And so that is how the industry is moving around AI. We'll get into a little bit more examples around it. I think the takeaway is AI is going to be super easy. It's already easy and it's coming down to the masses. And we'll show you a little bit of applicability of how it's getting easier and how it can be your friend. The other concepts really take into consideration platform modernization and AI together. And so when you think of this world of, of applied observability, this is the concept of measuring everything. So the we're going to see a quote later on, but the, the takeaway here is from the inception of time to, I think, 2003, there was a set of data and that set of data now doubles every two days. And so the amount of data that's happening is just astronomically and exponentially growing and people are measuring everything that they possibly can within their enterprise to get better insights, to make better business decisions and to get um, a leg up on their competition. What they're also doing is moving to real time data decisions. And so the concept here is measure everything, measure it in real time, and then democratize it. So make it central so everyone in your organization can see that data and use that data on models. And so this is the applied concept of observability. Digital immune system is a combination of AI and applied observability. This is where the organization heals itself in real time. And so this is combinations of taking automation within the business processes, taking AI, taking all the data that you've measured, combining it into one system to make sure that you are observing, reacting, and being proactive in your, in your business communities, and whether this is in processes, whether this is in security tools, whether this is in sales, this concept of measuring, testing, and then auto remediating in real time is coming front and center. Um, the ability to make decisions in real time with data and having tool sets to allow you to consume that down to uh, manageable chunks is the whole concept of digital immune system. The other side, when we think of industry models, this is where companies are selling their data, plain and simple. So you get your whole data, you may have a data warehouse, you may not even start a data warehouse, but basically what companies are doing is they are taking their data sets, pulling out proprietary information and then selling them on open marketplaces. And uh, the best example I could use this is we have a client where we helped did this, do this for, where they sold paint. And what they did is they pulled out all of the proprietary information. What the data they did provide was we sold this much paint in these regions with these colors, with this sizes of cans. And what who bought that data was an aluminum can uh, manufacturer. They came in and paid multi millions of dollars for this data, and they knew right out of the gate how much aluminum they needed to have in certain regions, how they needed to cut it, and the types of sizes that they needed to have ready to support that kind of model. And so the trend here is companies are monetizing their data. They're not just viewed as cost centers. The data are viewed as profit centers now. And companies are bringing in different industries, models, data into their own. And they're using that data across platforms to get better business decisions and insights. Um, when we move down to Web3, this is blockchain, this is AR, VR, this is the metaverse. People hate it, people love it, it's popular, it's not popular, um, but it is here and it does have business applicability today. 
and some of the business applicability is the AR VR for business purposes. And the best example I can use here to make this tangible, we have a client who has VR goggles and they're fixing machines out on their manufacturing floors. And instead of flipping through manuals, they go into their VR goggles and they see somebody doing it real time in 3D so that they can then make it applicable and do that same machine. So this has real applicability um, in these models. Blockchain is gaining traction. So the, the, the ledgers um, to use for different types of uh, business applicability, I guess the best one on blockchain would be everybody here I'm sure has bought and sold a house and they hated to pay um, you know, insurance on title. There's no need for it really. And so one of the inefficiencies blockchain is solving is your house becomes an NFT and it gets written on the blockchain. And once it's written on the blockchain, there's really no need. The title chain of security is irreparable. Um, it's on a general ledger that's open to the public. Um, and it's very hard without consensus to change that you own the title. And so there's some really world uh, applicability happening in Web3. Uh, hybrid cloud, this one's popular. You know, everybody had the big mass migrations to the cloud. Cloud was going to solve everything. Well, when people got there, they realized that cloud was a little bit expensive in some cases, not all cases. The technology of 5G and now 10G are coming to lights. Edge devices are getting a little bit better that you could place on the edge of some of your uh, networks. And the evolution of IoT are making it easier and cheaper for people to do compute and storage and their own edge devices and not bring everything to the cloud. And so the concepts of hyper cloud are becoming very popular. I think the other thing to take away from hybrid cloud is hybrid hyperscaler. And so the concept of you don't need to just standardize on one hyperscaler. You don't have to be an AWS shop. More and more clients are becoming hybrid cloud hyperscaler in Austin, meaning they'll have their data on the best and cheapest tool sets in AWS, and perhaps they'll have their added modern apps and SaaS products sitting over in Azure. And the tool sets and the integration points are reached a point where it is not only cost effective to do it this way, but functionality effective as well. So when you're thinking about um, your forward-looking cloud strategies, I'd encourage you to think about hybrid cloud and hybrid hyperscaler. And the last trend that's across all products and services is sustainability. Um, you know, when you think about your strategic IT initiatives, it probably, your customers, your products probably should have a degree of thought around sustainability. It's very important to the masses, um, the concept of ESG, for your company's green stamp, when you're gonna become carbon neutral, carbon positive, um, how your products and services are efficient is a differentiator at this point in time and probably will be going into the future. That's quite a bit, but those are, you know, distilled down probably the eight top innovation and modernization trends that are gonna dominate for the next couple of years. Steve, you want to add anything to that or? No, all good. We'll, we'll definitely dive into um, platform moder modernization and some AI impacts on that as well in some upcoming slides. Okay, let's get to that. Okay, I think one more slide to take back from, that just reiterates what we just talked about. You can hear it from the think tanks, what they believe are going to be the top trends. You can get, pushed from the media about what the top trends are, but get something real, some real data. So this was a SMB, a small mid-sized business spend survey that went out to a super large number of worldwide clients. And this is their responses, that they are going to basically spend uh, on the trends that we just talked about. So it kind of confirms the need for security, data platforms, hybrid cloud, AI and business automation were top trends that are going to be spending money on. So 
this is a quantifiable, you know, validation point from actual people kind of validating what these think tanks are thinking. And this is where the dollars are being flowed to. So just another point I thought was more graphical and more, more consumable. When we flip to a little bit of deep dive, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on AI. And so again, the trends here are, it can be complicated. You hear so much about it. Every day there seems to be a new tool coming out. There seems to be a new cool way of using AI. A lot of that stuff is forward thinking. So what we distilled down for you again here is the top trends that are happening in AI now that have real business applicability or outcomes. And these real applicable outcomes that are happening today are using AI to do business process automation, increase productivity uh, within your internal tools and teams and resources, enhancing your products, so layering AI into your products and services that you offer to your clients, improving customer and employee experiences. And so this is a little bit about chatbots, looking up your chatbots to your data, open data and closed data, and obviously identifying reducing risk. So using AI to identify security breaches, um, reduce the inefficiencies in supply chain and things of that nature. So these are the major four outcomes. If you're being asked by your organizations to say, how can we use AI? You want to start with these four outcomes, which are real. These are quantifiable. There's business cases around it. There's landing architectures. And some of the top trends that we'll talk about next are directly on how you can get these outcomes. So can I, flipping over to the left side of the screen, you should think about AI in three, three ways today. Number one is open generative AI services. So we talked about generative AI at the top of the stack here in this presentation, how it takes information and starts thinking about it. You guys would know this as ChatGPT, Bard, Badu. Again, I think there's a whole bunch of these happening every day. This is where you take natural language. So somebody types something in and they get an output presented to them. Very easy UI, very generative. Um, the next one is the hyperscaler tool sets. And so this is where you can get real business applicability on automation and productivity. So as an example, with AWS Recognize, we can take automation of I'll use the uh, invoices. If you guys get invoices emailed to your teams, you can write automation scripts using these OpenAI and hyperscaler tool sets to parse the invoices, whether that's pictures, whether it's texts, and automatically place that into your data warehouses, into call APIs into your applicable tools. But what it does is automation tools are taking out the human element and human error of natural language of images, text, and data, and doing it at a lightning speed. And so automation tools is definitely one way that you could uh, use this stuff. We'll get into a, a few examples on that. Um, another one would be simple automation tools is Empower Platform for Azure. So this is where you could say, this is where I say, if I get an email from my awesome CEO, Jonathan Lerner, send me a text in Teams with a big happy face. And so business automation using AI uh, is, is definitely front and center. Productivity is one that's also here and it's on the rise. And this is where they're taking the engines that power ChatGPT and BARD and they're hooking it up to productivity tools in the hyperscaler. You might know this as uh, Microsoft Copilot or AWS Code Whisper. And the applicability here is this. If you're sitting in Microsoft PowerPoint, if you're sitting in Microsoft Word, or you're sitting in Microsoft Excel, let's just take the example of PowerPoint. You could go in there and say, hey, create me a presentation on AI. And Copilot is a side window within that product suite now. 
and it will come back and it will probably build the presentation that you're getting today that you're looking at right now. You could then say, okay, take this presentation and put it into intervision branding and it will take all of the branding elements that it knows in your organization because it's hooked up to your Microsoft 0365 organization and it will layer in all of your icons, um, branding elements, and in within seconds, you'll have a presentation that allows you, that is branded that would might take you hours in a matter of seconds. And so the, the takeaway here is the easy natural language interfaces are here within the major product and productivity suites from Microsoft and AWS that will allow everyone in your organizations to do things a lot faster that might have taken hours before. Now, Code Whisperer is the exact equivalent, but for if you take it down to coders. And you guys have probably heard about this, but if you go into any of their coding tools and it have Code Whisperer hooked up, they could say, take a look at this code and optimize it. And within seconds, Code Whisperer will go off understanding the coding languages and it'll optimize the code that they've written. It gets even simpler if they say, hey, write me some code that when I get an email from my CEO, Jonathan Lerner, go send an email back to them and say, yes, I'm going to do that uh, within minutes. And so this, and it'll come back and it'll write that code for you, whether that code is going to be in Power Platform uh, as a workflow or if it's in an app. Um, Code Whisperer and these tools have the ability to take your natural language and the way you think about a business problem, go off into the back end and get the technical code, information, and data, and bring it back into a consumable method for you to use to get that business objective. And that's what the productivity set of AI tools is doing. And so, uh, Again, three ways you should think about this is automation AI tools, productivity AI tools, and then the last one is hybrid learning models. And so what's happening here real time today, and we'll use the example of if you have a application or if you have uh, a website with a chat bot, what clients are doing is they're hooking up those bots um, to their datas with these productivity open AI tools. And they're allowing it to say, hey, on the website, give me the InterVision branding set. And it'll go off and it'll go to the website and search and bring back the branding set in the chat bot for the clients. It'll also go off into an open AI model, so chat GBT, and it'll look at all of the world's data on InterVision or your company's branding elements. So it's a combination of taking the learning models that are in closed environments, proprietary information and giving outputs, but also using the open AI models, which takes the whole world that ChatGPT and BART know and bringing the same responses back in. And then together your AI engine uh, learns and gives back a combination or a best response. So some pretty powerful stuff. Right, this makes going to a website, for example, super innovative and a new experience. Instead of having to search through 15 different pages to find the branding elements for a company, you could just simply go into their chat assistant and type it into natural language saying, I need a GIF image of this company's logo with this size, and it'll go find it either on the open AI chat GBT, or it'll go off into the closed chat uh, GBT learning model of your own branding elements internal and then come back with the client to get that actual GIF with that size. And so these types of um, improved UI, business outcome related, productivity and automation flows with AI are happening today. And so you don't really need to worry about, I think, we'll go to the takeaways on this, you should think about AI as your friend. It's multi-purpose, it has those applicable business scenarios, which we talked about. Don't be afraid of it. I think I'm going to show you a quick example here of how easy it is um, to, to adopt AI into your learning models. And then tech adoption needs to be accounted for. 
So one thing that we coach all of our, our clients on is while AI is being easy from a tooling perspective, the cultural shift in your company's ability to adopt AI and to get to that natural, natural language transitions where it's trusting the output coming from the AI tools is a culture shift. And that tech adoption is new and it will take time and we recommend it does, it's, it's consumed in a series of steps. So it, your speed at which you do this definitely needs to be accounted for. And I will say that InterVision is on the leading edge of this. So we interact daily, strategically with the hyperscalers to develop these tools, to create solutions around these tools. But like Jonathan mentioned on the onset uh, in the introduction, we help clients, whether you're starting this journey strategically, or maybe if you're more mature down this journey and just need some help and guidance, we can come in at various levels and very um, hyper flexible models. Again, I want to make this really consumable today with some real examples around AI. I think there's a number of different examples of how it can parse images and text. I think one that I'll just say is you see streaming video events. So if you guys have cameras out in your in your workplace and you want to understand data that's coming from that without having to watch it all the time, you can parse your videos. We have a client that's using this where um, they look at the machines every day and if smoke comes off, AI will see the, sm the smoke come off and it'll send an alert. Or it'll, if it'll look at the temperature with a, a heat sensor, and if the metal's getting past a certain threshold, it will send an alert and dispatch people. And so it's really time streaming and parsing out video to get those real applicable world events. Uh, I have one quick video I wanna show you on just how easy this is. Uh, and I will, right now. For this. Hi everyone, while Brent's getting that ready, we have a poll question coming up. So watch yeah. your uh, watch your screens and interact with us, please, and he will take it away. Okay, this will be quick, then we'll pass it over to Steve. Everybody see the screen? Yep. We do. Okay. This is how easy it is to do learning models today. So you can't see me, but I'm going to look at my webcam and it's going to record me. We're going to record another instance on the webcam. This is how you teach models. This is how easy it gets. It's a very cute bear, Brent. Yeah. Go to this webcam. Now, you train the model. You, there's business applicability for this would be as if your customers, you could input all of your customers, you could input all of their service orders, you could input a new product that you want to overlay, and it will learn from your data. So you can see right now, it knows it's just class one. It knows it's this, this. If I stick up the bear with the glasses, it knows it's class three. So let's just say you had bear with classes. It knows it's kind of, it's going between class two and class three. So these kind of outcomes that get learned, you can make really quick business decisions. So think about a class with tens of millions of classes of data, learning, and then providing the outcomes. So super, super quick and super easy. Uh, this is how AI has come down in learning models. Within seconds, you can generate the stuff with the, the hyperscaler tools we talked about. I'll pass it off to Steve, um, but let's do a poll quickly. What's your top concern about using AI? Everybody, put some answers into the poll. Maybe give it a minute. Yeah, the poll's all wrapped up and the results are there. What was the winner? 
Uh, right now, our winner is to be used for malicious purposes with 16% of the respondents. Thanks. We had a small sample set, but I appreciate everybody jumping in. Yeah, I can tell you that the world thinks it's C, lead to loss of control. And so um, it's, it's such a big thing that you guys might have heard that um, the creators of OpenAI um, and a whole bunch of Fortune 500 business leaders have asked for a six month moratorium on AI development so they can put policies and procedures around its usage um, and what to do if it gets too smart. I think that's a little bit Terminator type um, thinking, but they are concerned on how you pull the plug if models lead to too much learning and then too much trusted AI. I'll set Steve up here with this quote. I think we talked about it at the onset. It's here to, um, I'd say, incentivize, make aware, and scare you that you need to start thinking about modernizing your apps and data now. And it just comes down to simply the amount of data is going to be coming unattainable. It's doubling every two days. It's going to get more and more without some type of data strategy and apps that can handle the data coming in. You simply won't be able to adapt your products and services or internal tools fast enough to make real time business decisions to differentiate your companies or support your clients. And so how do you do that? How do you modernize your apps? That's next. Yeah, thanks Brent. And the data is coming from everywhere. So um, let's just talk about how to get a handle on that. So uh, applications are moving to AI driven and event based cloud native, um, you know, uh, serverless. You'll hear a bunch of terms, uh, microservices about that. So let's, let's dive into that first. Um, so, you know, pretty common uh, application or service pattern today is to create a container. Uh, you might have heard of a previously a virtual machine. And then you'll hear things about containers. It's essentially a, a, a virtual container where you put uh, all of your software and all of your lo business logic and everything inside uh, to execute some uh, portion of your business. And you can create multiple of them and, and kind of wire them together. Um, but essentially you're configuring machines, you're installing software, uh, you're configuring all your apps uh, and services, you're monitoring um, you know, those containers, you're upgrading them yourself, you're managing performance, you're scaling them up and down uh, if you have capability to do that. Um, or they're running all the time. Uh, you're dealing with security issues, you're managing security updates, you're kind of doing everything yourself. So um, you basically create the container, you put all the software inside you need. Um, you know, you have a DevOps team, you've got IT teams, you've got software developers all making this stuff run. Um, and, you know, it, it gives you the most amount of flexibility. So you control everything, but it also imposes a pretty high tax. On your organization, um, so that's that is uh, could could be a pretty significant business cost. Um, for every improvement you make to the system, you kind of have to consider everything that's already there, what needs to be upgraded, uh, what you're adding new. Are you adding new containers? How do you orchestrate all of them together? Right. So it's uh, every every time uh, you you know, and we see this pretty commonly. When you make an improvement, the demands on the team and the system complexity increases. Um, so serverless or event-driven architecture becomes attractive here. So cloud service providers like AWS and Azure and GCP, um, they offer containerized uh, the containerized approach for you. But there's a new mode of building uh, systems, and they offer individual purpose-built systems that can be assembled kind of like Lego blocks uh, to create a product uh, or a business system. For example, you might have a Lego block that handles user authentication and user management. You might have another block uh, that's great at sending email. You might have another one that stores your data uh, and yet another one that knows how to uh, learn from the data and analyze business trends or present them as a business visual, visualization. 
so some benefits of this Lego block type approach are these services are built and maintained by the cloud provider and they hire industry experts. So you're kind of benefiting from a group of experts that have created this module for you rather than you having to ramp staff and manage all this stuff yourself. Um, also, they handle all the, the basics uh, like networking, configuration, upgrading, uh, performance tuning, security, compliance, scaling things up and down. So most of these services auto scale up or down. So if you don't have a lot of load in your system, for example, people go home at night, um, these services will automatically scale down. When they log in in the morning, they automatically scale up. So there's some potential uh, cost savings there. And they also um, handle, uh, they also monitor them. So in addition to just creating those services, they've wired up the IT infrastructure so that you can monitor all of it. So each of these little blocks have their own monitor and you can monitor across uh, the blocks as well. And then um, they've made it really easy for developers, software developers. So where in a containerized world where you're basically selecting your own software um, and your developers are configuring it, they have to learn an API for that. Um, the cloud providers like AWS, they have API or SDKs, uh, developer consoles that make it super easy to um, utilize these services and not only utilize these services, but integrate them together. So they have a very common approach to say, wiring up your authentication system with your mail system, uh, with your um, you know, database. So uh, super easy for developers to wire these services together into a solution. And they've done it in a couple of ways. So there's a traditional API approach, which you might be using where an API is exposed and you can call that API as a developer uh, and make things happen. However, as Brent indicated earlier, uh, in real life, like users use the system. So they um, take actions in the system and those actions in the system uh, can be exposed to the developers in the form of events. And that's where we get this term event driven. So for example, um, a user logs in, so an event is triggered in, in that Lego block, uh, and a developer can wire up code that says, okay, um, a user logged in, let's go send them a welcome email via the mail sending block or sales data was inserted into our database. So we know that that, that event happened. So let's go update Salesforce through with that integration or. Uh, a gaming system, a new high score was achieved. So uh, a piece of code can spark up and go update a leaderboard. So these events, uh, not only can you wire all of these uh, little services together to structure a business, but those services create events and you can react intelligently to those events. And that really enables you uh, to uh, create some very complex systems in a very easy fashion. Um, they've also, uh, the, these cloud providers, obviously, um, enabled you to enable you to deploy a solution globally. So where you would have to manage your own regions with a containerized approach um, and software and events, um, application logic, they basically have these things as just selectable options. So you can wire up all your blocks, you can handle all of your events, and then cloud providers, you know, make it pretty easy to, you know, click a button and say, I want it to ship here in US West, the East Coast of the US, Asia, Europe, et cetera. So uh, super easy to put these things together, um, you know, for uh, a software development staff. Uh, they also monitor everything. So each of those little blocks, as I mentioned, has their own logs, their own alerting, their own um, thresholds for alerting, uh, the way you get alerted. So soft system errors, software errors, performance issues, security issues, it's all wired up for you. Um, and you know these things, it seems like they spark up every day. So across cloud providers, new services or new Lego blocks come online for your teams to take advantage of.
pretty frequently. Um, so, you know, AI gets layered on top of that and it kind of, AI takes that type of architecture, that event driven or serverless architecture where all the infrastructure is managed for you, everything scale, everything's managed for you. You just focus on your business logic. The next level is API. So I mentioned uh, software development teams. So from a, pro a product or system creation perspective, um, you know, Brent mentioned Code Whisper. Teams are using AI to, which represents essentially the best minds in the industry or the engineering best practices uh, to, um, you know, ask things like make source code recommendations for me or just give me the source code that will show me how to send that email from the mail sending um, Lego block, right? Uh, and these systems will basically give teams the code to do that. Now, it's not necessarily perfect in any case, like systems are, are fairly custom when you get down to that level. However, it is an incredible time saver. And, and ChatGPT is the same thing, right? You can say, go, you know, write me a Python function to, uh, to send a piece of mail, right? Um, the, these kind of things are super um, useful to developers because they do offer proper structure and engineering best practices uh, kind of baked into that recommendation. And from there, you, a developer could take it and customize it uh, as needed. But there are other things like gathering market intelligence, as Brent mentioned, organizing projects, um, you know, making source code management recommendations, even reviewing code. Um, so there's a service called Code Guru on AWS where team members, when they you know check into a Git repository, can uh, basically uh, get their code reviewed and um, get a, a recommendation back that says, hey, we see your code is structured like this. You might consider structuring it like this, uh, representing, again, some best practices in the industry. So not only help me write my code, but I've also reviewed your code. And, you know, those kind of things create quality and reliability and trust in the systems that get produced um, from engineering teams. So, I mean, your engineering team is only as strong as your strongest person on the team. Uh, with these type of tools, your engineering team is as strong as like the best minds in the industry. So, uh, super useful from a product system and uh, our product and system creation perspective. But it doesn't stop there. So, after deployment, um, a lot can go wrong. Um, and there's AI that keeps an eye on your running code. So, uh, for example, performance, uh, uh, this again is a, a code guru in the case of AWS, looks at your running code and it looks for performance issues and it will flag those for you. Um, it looks at behavior anomalies. So if you have weird things going on in your code, it will flag those. Um, there's a service called Security Guard that will um, flag potential security issues with code. And security is an ever moving, um, you know, flag. So um, there are always advancements in uh, hacking and getting into your systems, and there's always advances in defending against that. So having um, industry expertise in the form of AI to um, thwart or hold off uh, security issues is, is a, a super useful uh, thing as well. Um, and, you know, it, it can flag these things for you, but in some cases, uh, these things create an event, as we just talked about uh, a minute ago, and your engineering team can react to that event, that event and automatically resolve the issue, either with code or logic or data or whatever. So pretty powerful. And um, Hey, Steve, I'm going to jump in here and say we've got another poll question up there for our, for our viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your top concern stopping you from modernizing your apps and data. So take a moment and answer that poll question. Uh, and while our listeners are doing this, I'm going to jump to the to Q and A in the interest of time. Uh, and we do have a question for either you, Steve, or Brent. Um, which is better, Chat GPT or Bard? And what limitations do they have? You want to take that? So Brent? either one of you. I'll take that one. Uh... I'll say at the outset, just to cover us, we are platform agnostic. 
and so it's difficult to say. They both have strengths and weaknesses. I would say when you're thinking about generative AI, which is what that concept is, they all have certain data sets, meaning they only go up to 2021. So everything that's happened in the last two years, ChatGPT and BART don't necessarily know about. And they're only as smart as the open data that's out there on the internet, meaning proprietary data for companies, real business differentiation is not part of the open AI models. So there are limitations on that. Um, and then I will say that there is data bias happening in some of these chat or gender um, open AI models, meaning uh, it's learned off of bias off the internet and it can't learn unbiased just yet. Um, it, as an example, if you thought an apple was red um, and it just saw pictures of red apples on the internet, it would think that apples are red. But in fact, apples can be green, they can be yellow. And so it's learned from, at some cases, bias, which is causing a little bit of misinformation. And so I'd say there's a little bit of limitation still with generative AI. Uh, I'd say that they're all progressing at the same pace, and I really couldn't pick um, which one would be better. But I will come in and say, you know, you can use these things in your apps too. So ChatGPT has an API, all of the cloud providers have an API, and you have access to all your data. So, um, and, and these services make it super easy. So you can have your business data, you can have public data, temporary data coming your log you know performance log data coming from everywhere you can curate that data to feed into these systems for your own private applications and uh, you, you can kind of like set that bias Brent was talking about up front to be useful to your customers do we have a, a poll question result Let me see if we have those results. I'm not seeing them yet. In the interest of time, I'll tell you that the answer to the world is time to market. Yep. People simply are concerned about these digital transformations taking too long. And if you recall, the ability to accept digital transformation or change, especially tech change or these modern applications, and consume it for the users or their clients is a real problem. And so at some cases, time to market is real. What well, one in our poll was complexity. Uh, we had 13% of the respondents uh, identify complexity as what they were most concerned about. So Brent, Steve, thank you so, so much uh, for carving out time to talk with everybody today. Uh, there's a QR code on your screen that you could, uh, you could click to go to a website to learn more uh, and get in touch with either Brent or Steve.